fourscore and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place to those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored de dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here re highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. <sighs> November 19th, 1863, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Lincoln delivered these small remarks in about two minutes. Uh, while sitting on a dais with an array of speakers, of which he was kind of an afterthought in the original planning. The primary speaker was a man named Edward Everett, who spoke at great length recounting the story of, uh, of the Battle of Gettysburg that had been fought months before, recounting uh, the uh, parallels from classical, uh, uh, classical legend and literature and giving it a grand uh, oration in the most formal and high-flown sense of the word. This was two minutes. This was nothing. This was just a few incidental remarks. But in that two minutes, um, Lincoln did more political work than he had done in really four years as president. Well, he was only president for about three and a half years at this point. Um, not even, two and a half. Um, the Gettysburg Address is justly famous for a lot of reasons. It is a, uh, a, a, a great rousing speech, uh, but it is curious for the way it is not that rousing, how it is somewhat informal and yet very formal. It is all these things that Lincoln was himself, and it is such a fine encapsulation of the man, but also of the nation. And that's where he really rises to the occasion. He was able to sit in his place and articulate a vision of this nation that would uh, come out successful. In the Civil War, he, he faced a, a cataclysm on a political and social scale that really no president had faced in, uh, in the history of this country before that. Four score and seven years ago, uh, things were troubled, but at least they held together. Uh, the Constitution came along and papered over some of the uh, questions about uh, the divisions in the, in the nation and just sort of punted on some of those basic uh, conflicts that over time uh, began to rub. And of course, we get the Civil War. Um, in this speech, Lincoln has to uh, create a sense for going forward. 
the war has been very difficult up to this point. This is November 63. He's having a good run, uh, but significantly, this is in Pennsylvania. The forces, the Southern Army, had made it that far north. This is not a, uh, a, a great sign. Now, the Union forces, the Union Army, the Northerners, had managed to push them back to repel this. But the fact is, they were still fighting on their own ground. So this is a sense of, you know, they're getting very close. And this is some months after the battle, but still, uh, how difficult would it be for them to come back? This is a critical juncture in the war. And Lincoln knows that uh, he, he's got to start to really produce results with it. It's starting to move his way. It's not quite yet. And of course, Lincoln is looking forward to, uh, he's going to be, uh, he's ending, he is one year away from a national election. In November of 63, he can look forward to November of 64 when he will find himself on the ballot again. Now, it's not, uh, you can't automatically assume that he wanted to run for re-election, that, you know, this was a natural course and that he was doing anything just to get re-elected uh, from that selfish ego thing. The single-term president was kind of a standard throughout most of the 1800s. Lincoln is really kind of a standout in that. I, I don't believe, uh, I, I, I think Andrew Jackson was the last president to serve two consecutive terms. So he would be perfectly, uh, uh, nobody would think anything the worse of him if he's just served his term and then, you know, bowed off the stage and went off and lived a nice, happy life. But of course there was the war. He knew anybody who got elected following him uh, was going to perhaps seek to wind up the war, seek to just seek a compromise. You know, okay, Southerners, you can have your slavery. Let's just work within some, uh, some, some limits. Now, Lincoln very famously once said that uh, if I could preserve the, uh, the Union by getting rid of slavery, I would do it. If I could preserve the Union by maintaining slavery, I would do it. The priority for him was always the Union, um, a, uh, a, a belief, a faith, a, uh, a, a clinging to the idea of Union that one notable critic of his at the time said was near mysticism. But I don't think he really... I don't think he was ready to sell out on that just yet. I think he was trying to come to a place where the nation would see the need to cling to the union as well. And so he was willing to stand for another term and just to uh, prosecute the war and wrap it up. Um, he felt called to greatness. He felt in many ways, uh, historians will tell you that uh, he saw George Washington as a kind of rival or peer, uh, and that everybody in between was, well, you know, and for the most part, uh, obviously that is true, uh, especially leading up to the Civil War, we had some of the worst presidents in history. Uh, so. Lincoln was looking forward to, well, okay, uh, Washington, especially in the time of the, the Revolutionary War, was this figure who was able, through his vision for the nation or the force of his personality or his simple belief in the simple tenet of independence, he was able to hold this nation together and form it as a nation. And here we see Lincoln in a position where he is largely doing the same thing, reforming it as a nation and holding it together just a little more tightly. Um, so I would say that that is his prevailing ambition, to save the Union and bring, it, uh, bring the people of it to an understanding of unity. And this speech does that. It has a sense of where we have been 
where we are and where we're going. It has a sense of we are all one people. Um, it has a sense of the general character of the people that make up this nation, which has the same character as the people in it. He's working on all of these levels at the same time. And he is speaking in a language that everybody listening to him that day and everybody who would read the speech the next day in the paper, they were generally printed kind of verbatim, uh, although he did like to edit them a little bit as they made it their way to the printer. Um, it would garner a certain support. And so he's speaking in a very specific idiom to the general populace. Four score and seven years ago uh, has, as many people, many critics will tell you, biblical echoes. So he's starting out initially speaking to people in a biblical reference. Now, he was famously a great reader of the King James Bible and learned a lot of his style from that. And you can see a lot of the, the repetitions and the sonorous quality just comes right out of that King James Bible tradition. He was very well read in that book. Um, but also, it, he's thinking of his audience. He is appealing to them because for the majority of the American people at the time, they don't have a lot of uh, literary references. They don't have a lot of classical education. Edward Everett had just been up there talking about Pericles and had been talking about great, uh, great Greek heroes and myths. And they had all been, you know, wow, whiz bang, applauding at the end, but not necessarily following along with a lot of all the classical illusions. Lincoln dispels with all of that. And he says, okay, I'm going to speak to you in terms I know you get. And in terms that open up a sense of uh, community and shared experience with all of us. He could speak now. Certainly, the nation was becoming more uh, um, uh, heterogeneous, as, uh, as you might say, at this time, lots of immigration. There were certainly other pockets and other religions and other cultures that, are, that were developing and existing and moving in. But it was very, it was still overwhelmingly a Protestant Christian nation. Uh, in the broad culture. And so he can speak to that as a unifying uh, thread. He understands the language uh, brought forth on this continent. Notice the, the particulars there, the definite articles. This, this continent, he is bringing them back home. Again, after Everett, who is soaring in his rhetoric over time and space all over the place, he is bringing you back to this place repeatedly throughout um, our fathers brought forth on this continent notice also our fathers united our fathers on this continent a new nation conceived of liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal which is quoting jefferson another one of his great forebears whom he has a uh, a a great respect for in many respects, and a little bit of a you know a Jefferson on slavery. Uh, so there was some there was another rivalry issue there. I think it's fair to say. So he deals with this as historic. It starts off biblical and it ends up with the uh, with with the with the quoting of the Declaration of Independence, both historical in the past, uh, but also the biblical and the civic tied together, um, a kind of civic religion, if you will, a religion of uh, government. Um, and then he brings it from the past into the present. Now, that's that's a nice little throat clearer. That's a nice little shift, but it also just brings everything into the present. He set the tone with the past, showed a little continuity, showed the uh, showed the stretch of it, the uh, the the context. Excuse me, but but when he wants to bring it to the immediate, he emphasizes that now we again we inclusive we are engaged 
in a great civil war. Engaged is a very bland term. He's not going to say we are fighting. Uh, we are engaged, like, you know, we're all somehow passively going along with this or uh, we're caught up in it. It's not a great sense of agency with engaged. Uh, engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived or dedicated can long endure. So suddenly he's pitching it as a, uh, as a kind of intellectual challenge. He is not mentioning slavery here. He is taking the crux of the conflict and intellectualizing it, saying, well, this is really more about the whole prospect, the proposition, if you will, as he says, that all men are created equal. He's using this as a kind of test as a kind of uh, experiment. Um, we are met, again, we, unifying, are, present tense, met on a great battlefield of the Civil War, reminding people once again, we are here. We are here. We're not off in Greece with Edward Everett. We're not soaring around the clouds in some objectified, uh, ethereal place. We are here. This is real. This is immediate. This is in our face. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here, here, gave their lives that this nation might live. Gave their lives, death, that this nation might live. Death and rebirth out of it. Um, also, uh, we have come to dedicate a portion of this field, which is kind of obvious. Everybody knows that's what they're here to do, but he's just fixing it in very simple language. Like, we're not here to talk about uh, the causes of the war. We're not here to talk about the abstract meanings of the war, necessarily. We're here to just do something very specific, and it's an action, and it's something that they're all engaged in doing. But it is very simple. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Okay. These little simple placeholder sentences that come in and just state the obvious, quite frankly. We're here to dedicate a portion of this field. Um, you know, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. It's almost like he's clearing his throat. There's just not much to these sentences, but they create a kind of almost hypnotic effect of just saying we're doing this this is what we're doing we're going to do this we're doing this now almost meditative almost trance like it's uh, kind of an incantation almost but but in a larger sense so now immediately he's yanking everybody back from that simple understanding of everything and forcing them back to try and take in a interpretive value, a symbolic value to what they're doing. We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground, which is a little bit of a challenge to them. No, I said that we were going to do this, but we can't. Creates a little confusion. It's a bit shocking all of a sudden, but he's going to bring them along to understand where he's going with this. The brave men, living and dead, who struggle here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. Again, the hour, unifying. Um, again, a sense of humility that whatever they say here, literally, uh, he says is irrelevant, but it's the fact of their deeds, of their actions, that has the greater import. Again, this emphasis on action, on deeds, on doing something. Um, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but we can never forget what they did here, saying and doing, contrasted. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here, here, to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us 
to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. That is one sentence, one long, attenuated, very complex sentence. But it focuses on work, the task before us, um, uh, the unfinished work which they who fought here are uh, here. He's not painting a rosy picture. He's not even trying to be that inspiring about the goal. He's just saying that we need the task. We need to engage in the work. Imagine, imagine the positioning here. He is right smack in the middle of this war. It will go on for another, from here, about another 18 months, just like it's been going on for about 18 months. They're right in the middle. It's a crucial time. But he knows that the end isn't necessarily in sight. He knows he can't focus anybody too much on that. He needs to get them through it without stirring up animosity. You do not see any reference in any of this to the North, the South, slavery in general. All of that is gone. All of that is bled out of it. There are no specifics in this. It is all very abstract but it's abstract in a way that is immediately graspable because of the simple cadence and diction that he's employing. And he's using this as an opportunity to bring people along to where he needs them to be. He doesn't need them focused too much on the goal. He doesn't need to say emancipation. He doesn't need to say, you know, end slavery. He doesn't even need to say victory. He needs them to focus on the work. He needs them to just have patience, understand the process, and this is all about process, and see themselves functioning within that. The first graph of this, par of this speech is about the past. The second is about the present. And the third, the big long one, especially, uh, with a long sentence especially, is about the future and that sense of continuity, of being part of something that is much larger than yourself, much larger than any one individual, including himself. That's why he's always using the word our and we and us. Seeing that, part of a larger progression towards proving an abstract ideal about self-government. That's where he needs them to be. That's what this speech does. It takes them, bleeds out all the animosity, all the frustration, doesn't give them a whole lot of rallying cries or, you know, we are the champions type stuff or we're going to go get those rebels. But moves them from a place of some uncertainty where they don't know what the future might hold to a sense at least that they are part of something much larger, not just an individual in a crowd or one soldier in a nation, but rather part of a historic progression of uh, the ideal of the nation itself, the identity of the nation itself, self-government. The proposition that all men should be are created equal. Proposition. He want he is a very logical man. He wants this to be something to prove almost mathematically. He is thinking in Euclidean terms for God's sakes. He has a proposition and now they are setting about proving it. And this gives you a kind of a uh, de-emotionalized objectivity about the whole thing. The ability to sit back and say, okay, things are bad, 
might not get good for a while, but we understand our role. We understand the stakes. And the stakes aren't just, you know, slavery or not. The stakes are our ability to settle our differences within the structure of government, within a belief in this nation as special, within the American experiment as an experiment, and an experiment that sometimes needs a little help along the way. So you cannot be passive. You can be objectified, you can be objective, you can be dispassionate, but you are engaged. You are engaged with the task at hand, the work to be done. It's empowering to see that. To a nation that is scared about the direction of the nation, they're uncertain. And uncertainty breeds fear, giving them the opportunity to feel like uh, soldiers. Because for the most part, the people in the audience aren't soldiers. Giving them the opportunity to feel like we're all in this together, no matter which uniform you're wearing, even. It gives them a sense of calm because they have some control, they have some agency, they have some ability to affect the outcome, they have the ability to do the work. Wherever the work may lead, the task is in front of us, we're going to do that work. The speech does all of this. The speech lays it out very simply. It's It drives home certain words, obviously, it drives home we and our and, and, and us, uh, to emphasize the collective, it drives home those sense of work, of task, of being engaged, driving home that message again and again and again. Repetition works. Say it again and again and again. And then when you're done, say it again and again and again. All of this comes through. Lincoln knows this. And because he's speaking in a fairly simple idiom that makes use of lots of uh, rhetorical, not tricks, but techniques of repetition, of cadence, of the simple structure of your sentences so that you begin with a subject, follow with a verb, and you have a fairly short sentence following it that drives home a simple message until you want to mix that up in the end sentence that just goes on and soars and builds and builds and builds and ends on a high note. He was a master at all of that. But because he was a master, he knew not to show off too much. And he knew that the point wasn't to impress everybody that he had all of these uh, classical rhetorical techniques under his hat, if you will. But he understood that the purpose was the communication, the speaking to an uncertain audience, imagining what they're going through, understanding their trepidation, and moving them through your speech from one place to another, so that at the end of that speech, they can have a sense that things are going to be okay. This is why he is perhaps the greatest president in the United States history. This is why he is one of the greatest leaders in the history of man.